Hi everyone, welcome to part two of lecture 18 where we're going to continue talking about the Atkins case. Um, we're going to get started in lecture two um, watching a, a C-SPAN clip for when the Atkins case was being tried. Um, and again, I think this is important. Um, I know C-SPAN isn't necessarily the most interesting thing to watch, but I think it really gives you guys a good picture of what folks were talking about, um, what experts in the fields were talking about at this time, and then what some of the callers were thinking. Um, whether they oppose or not oppose the death penalty, and then if they do or do not oppose the death penalty, how they do they feel about the Atkins case specifically? So we're gonna get started with that. So you're gonna start just by hearing a little Service background. From Hotline, thank you, Vaughn. You're welcome. Have a good day. You too. Robert Dinnerstein is an associate dean and law professor at Washington College of Law. He joins us now to talk about a case hitting the Supreme Court today concerning mental retardation. Thanks for joining us. Sure. Tell us about this case. Well, it's the case of Atkins versus Virginia, and it's a case that raises the question of whether defendants with mental retardation can be executed consistent with the Eighth Amendment, uh, the cruel and unusual punishment clause. And, and this case took a long journey before it got to the Supreme Court. Tell us a little bit about that history. Well, there was the initial uh, determination that uh, Mr. Atkins was guilty of the crime. He was sentenced. The Virginia Supreme Court, which automatically reviewed the case in the first instance, they affirmed the conviction, but they asked for a resentencing because there was a question about the jury form, the jury verdict form. So they then resentenced. He was sentenced to death. That sentence was reviewed and, and affirmed by the Virginia Supreme Court, and then that case was appealed to the Supreme Court. United States Supreme Court, which in September decided to hear the case. And what topic or what specific question do the justices have to address today? They're going to address the issue whether defendants with mental retardation um, can be executed consistent with the Eighth Amendment. Uh, they uh, addressed this issue some years ago in a case called Penry versus Linaw, at which time they said it, on an individualized basis, juries must consider mental retardation as a mitigating factor. But now the question is whether, in all circumstances, the evolving standards of decency have, have developed to such a point that it is cruel and unusual punishment to execute people with mental retardation. Give us a quick review of the Eighth Amendment and how it relates to this case. Well, the Eighth Amendment says uh, that uh, punishments that uh, the, the state, the government, cannot use or cannot impose punishments that are cruel and unusual. And in essence, what is determined to be cruel and unusual is a really is a several part test. In one instance, the court looks to see whether something was cruel and unusual at the time that the Constitution was in fact passed. Uh, and indeed, in Penry, the court said it was probably true that at common law, it would have been cruel and unusual to execute, say, somebody with profound mental retardation or severe mental retardation. For folks like uh, Mr. Atkins or Mr. Penry, whose case was up before, they were not in that category. However, even if something was not banned at the time of the Constitution's passing, over time it may be that society develops an attitude about a particular set of circumstances. Certain punishments that might have been okay in 1787 might not be okay now. And the question then becomes whether the execution of people with mental retardation has now evolved to the point where society as a whole says, we don't want to execute people uh, with mental retardation. And the process of going to the Supreme Court, the lower courts ruled on this, and if I read it correctly, mental retardation didn't play a case initially in the initial court case. Right. I think there was some question as to whether it was properly raised. I mean, the Supreme Court is not addressing those issues. The Supreme Court is, in a sense, looking at the broader question and saying, besides what might be the issue in Mr. Atkins' case, in general, is this, uh, it does somebody with mental retardation, uh, everybody with mental retardation, are they in a category of people who should not be subject to the death penalty? And we want to get your thoughts on this so again, that just provides you guys, again, some background, what folks were talking about. And I've mentioned all that stuff before, that, um, or in part one, that um, the reason why this was tried was to see that if um, the um, consensus of the country had changed, had changed since um, the Penry case was tried. And so now we're just going to get a little more information. classification of mental retardation, what impact did it play in the lower court's ruling? You said not much. Well, the, 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 issue, the lower court, there was a question as to whether or not Mr. Atkins really is a person with mental retardation. The, the uh, Commonwealth of Virginia and the defendant differ on that. The expert for the, the defendant said that he had an IQ of 59, which would place him in the mild or moderate range of mental retardation. And that was determined by an expert who 
conducted a, a, an IQ test and, and an adaptive test. The uh, Commonwealth had uh, at the sentencing hearing its own expert who didn't purport to apply a full test but took questions from different tests and he concluded that uh, Atkins was of normal intelligence. So it's possible that in the Supreme Court case they might make a decision about and say for example people with mental retardation may not be executed but might remand to a determination of whether Atkins in fact had mental retardation or not. Okay, we want to hear your calls and comments. So um, I played that clip because I think it's an, it highlights the importance of proper assessment in these cases. Um, so they mentioned that one examiner had found him to have an intellectual disability and another one did not. And in the second one, they're talking about that individual pulled questions from different tests. Now, I don't know the specifics of exactly what happened, um, but in general, when you give an IQ test, the whole battery should be given. Um, you can't pick and choose from different assessments. Um, without um, a really good rationale. So this also highlights the importance of following proper assessment and considering that in um, Atkins cases and how much more this kind of can be transparent when you're doing these those retrospective diagnoses. And um, Atkins never had, did not have a prior um, diagnosis of intellectual disability. So that just really highlights um, the importance of that. So now we're going to skip forward a little bit more. Oh, I don't know what that was about. Okay. I, I do. Um, it seems to me that the entire point about which murders, um, the degree of murder that uh, the death penalty covers has to do with people forming an intent, making a plan, and carrying it out, as opposed to somebody who kills at the point of the moment, etc. The very, very issue is that when someone is mentally incompetent, they are unable to formulate a plan and carry it out. And I must say, as a teacher, the IQ of 59 is extremely low. It is a borderline trainable IQ. And having taught children with IQs in that range, it is impossible for me to believe that that individual could formulate a plan and carry it out so that the death penalty would apply. I am opposed to the death penalty anyway, but the very issue here that we have here is, did this person and was this person capable of saying, I am going to kill this person in this way at this time, okay. making a cold-blooded killing, and therefore worthy of the death penalty uh, among those people who believe that the death penalty is proper. Thank you. How, go ahead, do you have one more comment? Uh, yes, just I, I think you point out, make some important points about people with mental retardation, really all people with mental retardation, um, they may have a le lesser capacity to do the kind of planning that you suggest. They also are more likely to respond to impulse, to be uh, able to be duped by, by others, by others involved in a criminal enterprise. This is not to say that they should be denied the opportunity or that they are not eligible for very severe treatment and punishment, including perhaps life in prison without parole. It is to say that, it, or at least the argument is, that at that highest level, that this ultimate penalty, it may be that that penalty should be reserved for people who have more cognitive and volitional capacity than people with mental retardation do. In the Atkins case, how conscious of it was the, the, the I'm sorry, Daryl Atkins in his actions? Well, I, I, he certainly was aware of what he did, um, and, and one of the things that, that has to be clarified here is there's various stages at which your mental state can come into play. In the first instance, you have to be competent to stand trial. You have to know what the nature of the charge is against you and be able to work with your attorney. If you're not competent to stand trial, you can't be tried under the due process clause. And so some people with mental retardation never even get that far. Secondly, you may be competent, but maybe at the time of the crime, you were unable to uh, conform your, your behavior to the, to the aspects of the law, basically make out what would be necessary here either. So he was competent to stand trial. He did not persuade the jury that he didn't understand what he was doing. Therefore, he could be found guilty. Now the question is the sort of narrower question of can, he be, can the ultimate penalty be visited upon him? Okay, on the line that supports the death penalty, we go to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Good morning. Go ahead. Yes, good morning. I support the death penalty because most developmentally delayed people are the victims and most are kind and loving and not criminals. And this man wasn't retarded enough not to know what he was doing when he did this terrible crime, and he should be put to death for it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, you make a good point, that, I, and I think this is sometimes why uh, advocates in this area have perhaps have been slow to make to, to pursue this. Um, 
uh, in discussing people with mental retardation as, in this case, a defendant who's uh, subject to the death penalty, one can have the sort of false impression that that describes most people with mental retardation. If there's some, they're an excessively dangerous group of people or, or something like that. That's, of course, not not shown or not, not shown to be true. Uh, I think the question, again, in this case, it's not whether he understood what he was doing, uh, which I believe that the verdict is that he did, but rather the question is whether un he has that complete level of capacity understanding. In the same way, uh, I don't like the analogy to, to young people because there are differences. You might say somebody who's 14 might have known what he was doing, committed a cold-blooded crime, and yet we would say as a matter of Eighth Amendment law, we may not put him to death. We can lock him up for the rest of his life. But, but it, is, it, it offends our sense of decency to put, say, a 14-year-old to death. For another perspective on this matter. So I want to pause there. So you had two callers saying some different things. Um, and I just want you guys, again, um, not saying either is right or wrong or one was more right or wrong. Or, um, it just is going to show you what people's thoughts and their feelings were at the time that this was coming to light. Um, and I think that this, you know, in there, it kind of highlights the importance of... Um, can individuals, you know, people really are, you know, at this time and still are concerned, does premeditation, um, you know, does that mean that they're not, um, don't have an intellectual disability? If someone was able to premeditate something, and in Atkins case, it wasn't necessarily the nature of the crime doesn't suggest that it was premeditated, but he did know what he did was wrong. And so should that be brought up um, when you're applying the Atkins decision? And generally what it's been found is that no. Um, again, what you have to do is establish whether or not they have an intellectual disability, so should they receive the death penalty. But again, I think it's very difficult, and as you're reading through some of the articles, to think about how difficult that could be and what are some ways maybe to protect against that. Because once people hear about the heinous crimes and their loved ones, it can be hard. Um, it can impact their judgment about whether or not an they decide whether or not a person has an intellectual disability. We are joined now by Doreen Crozer. She is the executive director of the American Association on Mental Retardation. Good morning. Good morning. Tell us about your uh, organization's involvement in this case. Well, we've been involved in the death penalty issue now for more than 14 years. Our association filed a brief uh, 14 years ago in the Penry case. And um, over, at that time, the Supreme Court did not rule in our favor. They did not uh, think it was cruel and unusual punishment. And since that time, we've been working in the states to try to get uh, death penalty legislation passed because the court indicated at that time they would look to the states for a consensus on whether or not it was wrong to execute with people with mental retardation. In the Atkins case, what specifically uh, does your brief say that you filed? Well, we have said that uh, we now have demonstrated a consensus exists uh, since 1988. There have been 18 states that have passed specific legislation outlawing the execution of mental retardation. And that is, um, you know, clearly represents that we have an unmistakable national consensus against executing people who are mentally retarded. Professor Dennerstein said that Justice O'Connor would be one to sway. In okay, I just wanted to pause there. So the person that was on the phone, um, she was from the American Association of Mental Retardation. Um, that is now the same organization that is um, the American... Um, that publishes your book. It just the term has changed from mental retardation at the end to intellectual disability. So again, I think it's important for you guys to kind of hear what the organization that we really look to um, as experts on the field and you know in this topic. And again, they publish your book. Um, what they kind of thought. We're gonna and then now I'm gonna get to just a couple of last callers um, that had some different perspectives on um, what they think about this. Yes, um, I'm calling from Greensburg, Pennsylvania. I'm a first-time caller. Thank you for C-SPAN. Go ahead. Um, I support this because la the lawyers are always labeling retarded as soon as someone does some, um, some sort of, you know, killing of four or five people. We had a case here just this past summer. We know this guy killed these five people. But yet still, they're still arguing over whether he's retarded or not. I say, if you kill crazy, you die crazy. Thank you. Well, uh, one of the things that, that is, I think, very, very tricky about sort of 
discussion in this area. Uh, nobody defends in those cases where the defendant is properly found guilty uh, the acts that are committed. I mean, there's no question about the heinous nature. If you're in the death penalty arena, you're already talking about very serious kinds of, of offenses. At some level, I think it's very hard for people who don't commit crimes to understand how anybody could commit, could commit certain crimes, whether they were uh, determined to have mental illness or mental retardation or anything else. The issue, though, is not the question of did they commit the crime. In this case, the issue is what what is the right level of punishment that they should be subjected to. You talked about how the court looks at the public attitude. Does it look at specific states and what they do about this issue? Uh, it probably would not look at particular states. It might look at particular states if there was a very well-developed record in those states uh, as to what had happened. But it, it's not often not going to have access to that kind of information. The the petitioners in this case, that is the lawyers for Mr. Atkins, uh, make the point that it's not really just counting up the number of states, but it's it's using the evidence of state legislation as an example of a national consensus. And in that in that case, they argue you should also look at the states where there isn't death penalty, because those people also may have a view about the death penalty's appropriateness. Another thing pointed out is that no state since Penry has passed a law specifically authorizing the execution of people with mental retardation. The fight seems to be over, do we need a specific provision preventing it, which some states have said yes, and others have said, well, we either don't have the problem, so we don't need it, or maybe we just would rather wait to see what the Supreme Court does. We go to Lenore, North Carolina. Go ahead, please. What's your position on the death penalty? And let's go to Virginia Beach, Virginia. What's your position on the death penalty? Uh, yes, I'm opposed to the um, death penalty uh, for the mentally retarded. Um, and I think uh, we've had situations here in our area where the mentally ill uh, or mentally retarded have been killed uh, by people who were not mentally retarded. And uh, we have had mentally retarded people from our area executed for killing. Um, I think there's a, the bigger issue is that this is failed public policy for mentally ill and mentally retarded altogether, that we're not providing the services that we need to be providing for people um, so that they don't even get to the point of killing or being killed. I think the caller makes a good point. Uh, one of the aspects of mental retardation, particularly for people at the, the higher or mild end of the scale, is that many of them try very hard not to be identified as people with mental retardation. Uh, going back to that earlier caller who said, well, won't, won't people now start strategizing about, about you know, how to commit the crime and make the person with mental retardation the fall guy so that he wouldn't be executed? Even though it might seem rational to do that, there are legions of stories of defendants with mental retardation who deny their mental retardation to their lawyers, let alone to the jury and to the, and to the judge, and they do that because they don't want to sound or be seen as being stupid or sounding stupid. So they overinflate their knowledge. They say they know more than they do. They want to establish their competence, which is a very strong motivation for them. And I think, as the caller says, perhaps those, those aspects, the good aspect of that should be built upon rather than, you know, dealing with situations like we have here. Lenore North all right, so that's all I'm going to show you guys. Um, and again, I don't. Um, I just picked a couple um, clips that, again, I felt like the conversation um, had after that the um, that they had after was um, helpful. Um, and especially in that last piece, um, how it talks about um, that faking bad or in, where would individuals try to fake this? And actually, again, the data does support. And you guys will read this throughout your articles that most individuals with intellectual disability, when this is suggested, um, are upset by it. They don't want people to think that they're not as smart as other people and if they've never been diagnosed or even if they have, um, they actually are offended. Um, I know I've consulted with a couple on a couple of these cases um, and in every single one when this is happening, um, they're offended um, that this is what they're doing um, when it's explained to them. So again, I'm not um, saying any of these callers were right or wrong and regardless how, you know, how about how you guys feel about them. I think, again, it's just important to hear different perspectives and what, the, um, what different people were thinking about at the time um, this was being decided. So some later developments in Atkins. So a jury in Virginia in 2005 ruled that Atkins was actually intelligent enough to be executed. Um, there was this piece that came up that said that he was, quote unquote, intellectually stimulated from interactions with his lawyers and his IQ was raised, which based on our knowledge of intelligence, we know that's probably, that's not how cognitive abilities work, but that was what was argued. Um, his performance, they said, on those IQ tests was also tainted due to substance abuse 
um, as execution date was a new execution date was actually set for 2005, but it was stayed, which meant that the old decision um, was there. And then lawyer misconduct led to a new trial, and the Supreme Court upheld their original decision. Um, and so I want you guys just to think about this for a second. And um, so individuals going through the Atkins case, um, when we're thinking about that whole idea between cruel and unusual punishment, I want you guys to think about that in terms of being told that you know, you're initially sentenced to death, and then you're not sentenced to death, and then you're sentenced to death again. I want you guys to think about that in terms of cruel and unusual punishment and if that adds um, a little bit to your thoughts or kind of understanding of um, the Atkins decision. So just some statutes passed after Atkins and you've got some articles that talk about this. So pay attention to those. Um, so when we're applying Atkins cases, um, it's important to know who the quote unquote qualified examiners are. And so pay attention to that in your articles. So who are the individuals that um, can give IQ tests and can make that decision? And as you heard there, and it's usually the case, there usually are multiple people that give, um, you know, the state and then the defense will hire different psychologists to do this, but it kind of will lay some of that out. And then further, it's important to note that, and you'll see this, that each state kind of has their own definition of intellectual disability. And also in each state, it's different as to who determines. So it's not necessarily the qualified examiner. They just present the data. And in some states, it's up to a judge, and in some, it's up to the jury. But usually, it's up to a jury, and that jury fact finders article um, is very interesting. So pay attention to that. And then there's also the Moore versus Texas case, which I have laid out for you guys, which is very new, just came out a couple, um, a couple months ago, I think just two or three months ago, in which it established what, um, what tools could be used and how and what definition could be used. So just some issues with assessment that I want to draw because, again, there are people doing assessments to determine whether or not an individual has an intellectual disability. We know that all scores come with them a standard error of measure, and we know we can't ever obtain a quote-unquote true score. And so um, the sophistication, again, to understand all of that stuff can be a lot. It's a lot of information to understand IQ tests and IQ scores, and you guys have a good understanding of this now because we have covered that a lot in Module 1. But just think about that information and why, how it might be hard for people to understand those scores and also understand some things that could impact them. Additionally, we know that the IQ test um, used is really important. We know our tests are refined and they get better over time. So was the most up-to-date testing used? Were proper protocols followed? Um, those things. Also, was an adaptive behavior measure used? We know that adaptive behavior is part of our operational definition. And it's so important that we have um, sound measures of that. However, especially in these retrospective diagnoses, we've talked about um, how it can be difficult if someone doesn't have a diagnosis, um, getting knowledgeable reporters at the time of the crime or before they were 18 years of old or 18 years age, ugh, 18 years old or younger, whether or not these adaptive behavior deficits um, existed. Um, if someone's been incarcerated for a while, think about in jail and just in prison communities how they may not have the opportunity to express some of the behaviors that are measured in adaptive behavior. So making sure that the um, examiner um, uses a good adaptive behavior measure um, and gets multiple informants and also some direct observations and they can't when they can in prison, but also understanding the limitations of those direct observations in prison. Also onset, this can be hard too if someone doesn't have a diagnosis. Um, being able to do a really good record review as a thorough assessment, making sure you can find um, that there was documented, um, um, there was evidence of this dis um, disability um, prior. And also the law's interpretation, which again, pay attention to that um, Texas versus Moore case. Um, the law kind of interprets assessment a little bit differently depending on the state. And then just this is a new case, well, it's newer. Um, it was um, the Warren Hill case. It's one of the more recent ones that kind of talks about some of the issues that are in the, Ac you know, in the Atkins decision in general. Um, and so um, he was granted a stay of execution just before he was set to die, which means like a, a kind of a, a stop. Let's look at this again. Um, but ultimately, I can say that Warren Hill was sentenced to death, but I'm just going to leave you guys with... Um, one last thing we're going to listen to, it's short, 
um, an NPR story about this case specifically. And I want you guys to think, um, again, about this case, um, about the information. What is it when you actually then hear about a case now, what does this change or add to your thoughts about the Atkins decision? And maybe what are the good pieces about it? And maybe what are um, some not so great pieces about it? Support for NPR and the following message come from Talenti, who sometimes go a little overboard, like accidentally breaking their raspberry sorbetto machine with too many raspberries. Their obsessiveness is what makes Talenti gelato and sorbetto great. Talenti, the delicious is in the details. Glad you know that now. <laughs> Mate's execution was halted last night with less than an hour to go. Prison officials had already begun preparing Warren Lee Hill's lethal injections when a federal appeals court stepped in. Hill has an IQ of 70, and his attorneys have long claimed that he is mentally impaired. The case raises questions about a Georgia law, a law that makes it hard for defendants to prove they should be exempt from execution. Here's NPR's Kathy Lohr. Warren Hill was in prison for killing his girlfriend. He shot her 11 times in 1986. Then while in prison in 1990, he used a wooden board with nails to beat another inmate to death. More than a decade ago, three state doctors that examined Hill said he was not what was then called mentally retarded, but all three have changed their opinion. In affidavits, they say their initial evaluations were extremely and unusually rushed. One said it was a close case back then, but after reviewing the record, now believes Hill does meet the criteria for, quote, mild mental retardation. The question is, is, is Georgia violating the Constitution by basically allowing people with mental retardation to be executed? Richard Dieter is with the Death Penalty Information Center, which opposes all executions. The Supreme Court in 2002 banned the execution of those who are mentally retarded, now known as intellectually disabled. Georgia was the first state to ban executions of the mentally retarded back in the 1980s. Dieter says forcing defendants to prove their impairment beyond a reasonable doubt is questionable and the strictest standard in the country. Georgia is the only state that has such a high criteria. Generally, it's more likely than not, you have mental retardation, you're exempted. So the issue is, did Georgia define its law too narrowly to be keeping within due process? Several groups in the state are working to change the standard, including the Georgia Council on Developmental Disabilities. Director Eric Jacobson is among those who've lobbied for a stay of execution and a long-term solution to change the Georgia standard. If Mr. Hill is executed, I think we send a message uh, to our society that we're not concerned about some of our most vulnerable citizens. We're not concerned about the people who probably need the law to stand up for them more than anybody else. State officials would not comment on the case, but in court papers they say Hill held jobs and served in the military, that he acted as head of the family. The state contends Hill failed to establish that he is mentally retarded. Further, they say he brutally killed two people and should pay for his crimes. The state attorney general is appealing this day, saying the execution should move forward. Joshua Marquis is district attorney in Astoria, Oregon. He says he's seen defendants change once they realize they're going to die, including Texas inmate Oliver Cruz, who Marquis says tried to manipulate the system. This is a guy that was claimed to be mentally retarded. And his IQ was in the upper 60s, but his performance IQ when he was intaked into the Department of Corrections was 106, which is high average. So I'm sure death row depresses people, but 40 points? Marquis says because of the mental impairment issue, the 11th Circuit is taking another look, but he says courts have already spent more than two decades reviewing this case. Georgia has dealt with a number of questions regarding its executions. In 2011, Troy Davis was executed for the murder of an off-duty police officer, even after nearly all of the witnesses recanted their testimony. Now the case of Warren Hill raises new questions. Advocates for the disabled say only 10% of those with developmental disabilities are identified at trial, and that the diagnosis is not often made until defendants are in prison or on death row. Kathy Lohr, and so um, I want you guys just to, this is an additional article you guys can click on um, to read if you're interested um, more about Warren Hill. Um, but based on that information, I just want you guys, again, the takeaway from the second part of the lecture is, what do you think about stays of execution, which he, Warren Hill said multiple of? Are they cruel and unusual? 
What do you think about the nature of his crimes? Um, should those be taken into account and should it not matter if he has an intellectual disability? And further, as this stuff gets publicity and um, information, you know, gets out in the press, what does, you know, how does this help or hinder the public's perception of intellectual disability, especially, again, thinking through that systems change model? Um, what do you guys think about that? And so pay attention um, as you're reading through all the resources and articles that are assigned. Um, and I'm, you know, excited to see your discussion posts on this. I hope you found this um, information interesting. And if you have any questions or don't understand anything, make sure you reach out and ask. And um, we'll see you guys later. Thank you.